Hi everyone, my name is Marinus Mans and I'm the author of The Alienation Gene. Today we'll be discussing the um, writing process or the writing journey. Uh, mine started in 2012 uh, when I wrote music reviews for a website called Besikfrat. Um, Johan Voss managed it, managed it at the time. He's an editor and a musician. Um, but then I had to stop doing that because of work commitments. And many years later, I think 2015, um, I had already stopped working and um, I had kept myself busy with writing reviews on my own, just for my own website. Um, you know, the 10 followers that I had. Um, but uh, somehow it got noticed by um, someone in the music industry and I met the Pichets, um Gifford and Sharon, and then I started writing for Vatkeke. Uh, I think I did that for many years, five years. But during those initial days, uh, Gifford introduced me to Samantha Miller, who is a lecturer in publishing. And she introduced me to Henk Breitenbach, who is an author, a published author. Um, and they had a look at my, I would say my, I don't know, <laughs> 40th draft or something like that. Um, and just helped me to get it to that extra level, you know, that I can actually show it to an editor or a publisher. Gave me a lot of input, a lot of insight. And I think it was Samantha who uh, told me about the Dragon Writers. And I you know, joined the group on Facebook. Uh, it's a group of independent writers. And yo, I can't remember how, how long, but maybe a couple of months, I was just looking at what they're doing. And you know, at some point, I decided to post a few things. And then I posted... Um, a question about how do I get in touch with an editor. Two names were given to me, and one of them was Noreen uh, Dorman. Noreen is not only an editor, she's a multi-published author. Uh, she's won many prizes. Uh, she's been involved in the media industry for many years and has a background in magazine and newspaper publishing, commercial fiction, independent filmmaking, print production management and advertising, and she also does book reviews. And of course, she helps people like me, who have no clue how to write fiction, uh, to knock our manuscripts into shape for the commercial market. So, in a few moments, I'll be talking to her. Yeah, let's see uh, if we can get some wisdom from her. Hey, how's it? Oh, hi, Nareen. How's it going in Cape Town? Hi, how's it? It's, it's, it's warm here. It's, it's warm here. Yeah, well, with, with us, I'm sort of like after, after, I mean, Monday was sort of like one of those days where you just, you look outside. Okay, quickly, I'm quickly go, go dash outside. You go outside and then you sh shower. So today, at least, it feels like spring, which is great. But um, yeah, so, but I'm sure the weather, I mean, I'm just looking at my weather app. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we're actually going to get rain on Sunday. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> well, as you, that's, that's Cape like Cape typically Cape, Cape Town. Huh? The, the first question I want to ask is how did it come about and why did you decide to take on private clients? Um, because I mean, uh, I, I, when I asked around, there weren't many editors that take on private clients. So that seemed interesting to me. And I, I was just curious. Um, I enjoy suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, I lie. Um, no, well, I mean, firstly, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Um, but the, the thing is, I enjoy editing. Um, and I actually really do like working with people who are who have no idea what they're doing. 
like me there's something really satisfying uh, you've been pretty good um but i'm i'm saying sort of i often a lot of people that i work with it's the first time they've written a novel um so it's kind of like they're always making the same kinds of mistakes and so i'm sort of like really it's very easy for me to sort of look at a manuscript and go okay this that that and it's sort of when i look at a manuscript it's sort of like how do I explain it? it's like a jigsaw puzzle a 3d jigsaw puzzle that unfolds in my head and then when i write the what i call my dear author letters it, i sort of like have my notes and I go you did this and did this and go look at that link and so what i do with what i love doing is i sort of in the first dear author letter is i give like anywhere between a thousand five hundred to sometimes even five thousand words of this is all the areas that we need to look at so what i sort of kind of do is i tutor or coach people just sort of tailor making my feedback in a reader report but also sort of in a way to coach them for self-study um which i think sort of helps people a lot more than just doing a generic writing course where you do xyz and you don't always know what's applicable to you so if someone says hey you're head hopping or hey your tenses are wonky or this is the difference between past past and past simple and you know all the different types of tenses so I, I i know what i'm saying but i don't know what the actual terms are sometimes it's a terrible thing that happens i'm it's not just me i've spoken to other editors and go yeah that thing that authors do what's the name for it and we're like i don't know i just know it's wrong but yeah we know how to fix it but we can't actually tell you what it is unless we have to go to google so yeah so i i love i love that idea of like taking somebody who's like rough and got all sorts of spiky bits and going Ooh, let's prune this and it's sometimes incredibly rewarding when authors just get it and then they you can see when they turn the manuscript in or when you start working on second or third or fourth manuscripts with them and you can see that they're not making the same mistakes and they're actually applying what you've learned and the writing's just getting better and better and better and that is for me for me that is like the most the best thing and i mean you've been you've fallen firmly into that category because you sort of like you don't make the same mistakes you make different mistakes and that's fine i like that because at least then you know you're not having to sort of work on the same things because i mean i've i've got these clients and they come to me and i say to them okay cool you need to learn to punctuate your dialogue properly and here are some links because I'm not going to rewrite blog posts that other people have done, you know, or I just try and find resources that will help them. And then they come with their next novel and their punctuation is still as shoddy as it was before. And I'm sitting there, I'm like going, why am I doing this to myself? I'm just going to <laughs> just take what I want to do is I'm going to, I'm going to deal with the mistakes, the major mistake. I, I made a lot of mistakes, right? I'm not going to publicly state all the mistakes that I made because I mean, I want to look like an idiot, but um, let's. I'm, I want to deal with each one of the bigger ones. Um, there is some. I'm sure there's editor client privilege. <laughs> You're not going to reveal the stupid mistakes I made, but I made a lot of them. But the major ones, the the major ones. Um, let's start with with plot structure. So the first thing I did was read Stephen King's on writing, and he said that he has no structure. And I thought, that's what I want to do. Big mistake. Huge mistake. Because I am not Stephen King. All right? Um, so my, mm -hmm. my, my first attempt was an interesting story, but I had no structure. <laughs> so why, why is it so important, do you think, to have structure? Is, is, is there, do people, um, do readers like Structure. They don't want to read all this artistic mumbo jumbo. I don't know. Let's talk about readers' expectations first. Um, when you're watching a movie and there's just something off with the movie and you can't put your finger on it, and then you realize maybe in hindsight that the characters didn't actually experience or they didn't grow from the the the, the, the problems that they're experienced. And they just sort of go from one bad situation to the next and then the story ends and nobody learned anything. Nobody became a hero. Nobody became better. It was just bland. Um, and, and, and much like Neil Gaiman and, and, and Stephen King, who all claim that they don't outline or anything like that, I think both of them are lying through their teeth 
um i think even if they don't i think even if they and this is look this is a big disclaimer this is my opinion um even if they don't think that they don't outline i do believe that they have read so many books and they've read so many stories that the actual bones of a structure of how to put a story together is so deeply embedded in their psyches already that they just do it without thinking and they make it look so effortless um and then you get me when i wrote my first short story oh god it was terrible it's somewhere on my deviant art page if anyone ever wants to dig into my deviant art and they'll find it and they'll laugh at me i wrote something called a flagon of mead and it was a story about loki stealing freya's mead and giving it to bust it was like this totally like mixing up all the different um deities and cosmologies and i'm wearing my neil gaiman influences on my sleeve there terrible story um i made every single freaking mistake i had head hopping i had multiple characters in one short story which is although it can be done it's generally not a good idea i had no proper ending it was it, the punchline so to speak was weak it was just it was terrible and um i mean i thought it was brilliant at the time it wasn't anyway but so then you know what i always say to people structure that when the, when people go oh, but structure hedges me in and whatnot now always and this is the analogy i've used with everybody and i, I probably even used it with you think of a good structure like a trellis that you put up and you've got this vine that you're growing and the vine will go all over the trellis but the trellis will give it shape and then later on when you go pruning and editing you can cut here and you can trail stuff there but you've got something that's just holding it up so that you're going from one point to another point that there are sort of waves of action that you've got your high point and your low point i mean you take the, those those little touchstones away from a story. Um, and although your reader will look at it and they go, they're not really going to understand what's wrong with the story. They will know and they will feel that there's something missing. Um, I've just recently finished reading a re-envisionment of um, his... Um, I'm not going to say this because I don't like calling out, but it was a really nice historical novel um it was based on actual historical facts but the author was having the problem that most people doing reconstructions of historical fictions and figures do is how do you make history exciting because you know history is messy people die young their lives are boring or they fail um how do you deal with it and so what she'd done is she'd introduced um a rebellion a slave rebellion it was set in ancient room and um she'd added all these things but they just did not quite fit in with the character because the character herself due to the fact that she was a woman in the roman era women in those eras did not have a lot of agency so she couldn't really make her you know xena warrior princess and so a lot of stuff happened off screen and it just felt like she was sort of floating through other people's lives so that was sort of the big problem there. And, um, you know, your average reader won't be able to sort of figure out what's wrong, but they can feel that things are just not right. So that's what I always say with structure. Um, look at Michael Haig. Oh God, I'm going to pronounce it. Haig. Michael Haig. Michael Haig. Haig. Yeah, it's pronounced Haig. Yeah. Yeah, Michael Haig. Okay, great stuff because I always say it the wrong time. I say it wrong all the time. Um, he's got a wonderful, the, the six part story structure, which when I first listened to that one and a half hour, um, many, many years ago, I listened to that one and a half hour masterclass on YouTube and it was like someone had taken a sledgehammer to my head. I was like, oh my gosh, head blown. And then I went and I took my next novel, which was actually this one on my shelf. Um, down the stars which as you can see it won an award yes um actually it won two awards um and i took that novel and i decided to plot it out using michael haig's structure and gosh it worked and it worked really well and i was like okay so this is not such a bad thing i still told the story i wanted to tell but it hit the notes Yes. And I think that's the whole thing with having structure is like your your hero 
he he's gets thrown into an adventure whether or not he goes into it willingly that's up to you to decide he might have a mental figure the mental figure might fall away look we're not going to be a slave to 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 our friend um joseph campbell but joseph campbell made some very valid points with his monomyth and um and i think the monomyth the idea of the monomyth as per joseph campbell does you do see echoes of that in michael haig's um way of doing things but the other one that's worth mentioning is dan Harmon, who wrote um he's responsible for rick and morty i don't know if you've watched rick and morty i have but each little episode yeah, I mean, those episodes are completely bonkers. And yes. in terms but of... Very cleverly written. Extreme, very well written. So Dan Harmon himself has also taken the, 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 the monomyth, but he's simplified it and he's made it much more easier to use. And he's basically got the Dan Harmon story circle. So I sometimes use a combination of that and then Michael Haig's um, method. And... My stories, I don't think my stories are formulaic. Um, I just feel that that's a way for me to say, okay, cool. What's the darkest point? What does my character learn? How does my character's inner journey change them? How does the outer journey change them? Where do the where do these two points eventually converge? And what does my character have to offer to the world now that they've gone through the belly of the whale, so to speak? So, I mean, you, you, it just gets you to think deeper and it gets you to ask questions about the story um, and it often helps you find endings um, because that's, I think that's the one thing that a lot of us struggle with is how do I end the story? Mm. What happens? And um, I mean, your story gets completely bonkers. I mean, I remember where it started and where we ended. It was like, what the heck? But it's cool. And it was, and I love, I love that sort of playing, playing with reality that you've done with, with your God, I can't pronounce your aliens names. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't even remember them. No, it's the Darwinians, the Darwinians. And uh, well, yeah, you know, I just so had that. fun. But 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 the, the what happened was, it was all just I wanted to be all artistic, you know, and just be, have freedom of exp of artistic expression. But the moment you sent me the plot structure, um, I could I, I could there was there was just so much more. That I could do, I could the reality part of it. I could merge with the bonkers part that I wanted to do, but it wasn't it wasn't that far out anymore. For me. It's still far out, but it's still far out. But there's a storyline. I'll get to mm -hmm. to some of the other, um, like for instance, um, when we talk about the exposition and the characterization later on. Uh, the moment I started doing those things, my characters, even in this weird world, my characters were stronger. Um, for instance, mm -hmm. let's, I'm going to skip a little bit and say characterization, for instance. Like when you, when you told me about the fact that I am only focusing on one person, it's tied to the fact that I was lost in this artistic, you know, whatever I was doing. Mm -hmm. The moment you told me about characters that I'm neglecting, um, like for instance, one character, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to name names now because people have to read the book, but the one character yeah, just yeah. had no agency. And mm -hmm. the moment I gave that character agency, it enhanced my protagonist. Not only enhanced the, the, the character itself, it enhanced my protagonist. Why? Because characters talk to each other. They've got conflict. Um, and and so that 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 it, that helped me a lot with with, with characterization. But mm -hmm. I think the plot structure. If I can come back to the plot structure now, is that gives you a broad overview of what. And I I had only one protagonist, and I think because I was head hopping a lot, um, something you alerted me to. What I did was I created two protagonists: one major protagonist, and the other one is just a point of view character. And, and, and I had these two, I used Michael Haig's structure. Um, and at first I just used that structure on the protagonist itself, the main character. And then I found myself using it on both those characters. So they both have this, a character arc now. And it's just so much more rewarding. Yeah. And then this evil guy that just does stuff because no one knows why he's doing it. 
But if you have that character arc and you can go yeah. back to to that, then there's a reason. There's reasoning behind it, and that that, as you said, it's like <laughs> just like a okay, that makes sense to me, and it also is like a compass, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I think the thing that people forget sometimes with bad guys is that the bad guy is the hero of his own story. Um, it's just that his his intentions and his goals are cross purposes with the hero. Um, I'm just trying to think here, like for instance, Darth Vader serves the Emperor, and he he acts as the Emperor's tool. So anybody who's standing against the Emperor becomes Darth Vader's opponent. Um, Darth Vader doesn't see himself as being evil per se. I mean, sure, he's into the whole dark side of the Force, but I don't think he, I don't think he sees the dark side as being de- that terrible. Um, so, but yet now, on the other hand, you've got Luke Skywalker. So I always use Star Wars as a as a as a learning tool because just about everybody knows it. And of course, now you've got Luke Skywalker, who's um, just being fed all the light side propaganda the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you can see what I'm getting at. So people, people swallow ideologies. They get ideas that get rooted into their minds. And the, these ideas become so crystallized that they end up, um, you know, each other's boogeymen, so to speak. I mean, Cobra Kai is a good this. example, right? Cobra Kai, where they, where they took where they took the two sides and you don't know who who's the bad guy and who's the good guy anymore. You watch the movies when you were a kid, but you don't know is it the Cobra at some point you don't know who's bad and who's good. And then obviously later on, but you're always guessing who's bad and who's good. It, it, that I love that. I love morally great characters. I love it because it just makes them more interesting. Um, you know, and also like I don't think I mean, in real life, I don't think anybody is really evil. It's just they might be corrupt, but, you know, the thing is they might have find reasons to justify the corruption. Um, or they might find themselves in a situation where they have taken money from somebody to do something and they realized it was not good, but now they've taken the money so many times that they're stuck. Yeah. So they'll carry on taking the money. And, yeah, that's um, like you know, my style one. Saruman is like that character. Yeah. Not, I don't want to preempt it, but he is like that. I tried to, to put to exactly what you're saying. I tried to put that in that character. I'm going to do th- these three ones. I'm going to do in, in one because I think they're all tied, right? The, and th- these are things that you picked up just from watch, just from reading what I wrote and the way in which I wrote in the beginning. Third person, deep point of view. Show more than tell and fight scenes. I think in my novel, those three things were tied. And I, I look at it like it's, it's like learning a different language. And all of these things are different dialects of that language. That's how I saw it when I, because the way in which I had to deal with these things is you send me a lot of reading material, right? I read all that stuff, then went back and applied it to my flawed novel over and over and over again until I understood the language. I'm not saying I got it right. I mean, if you, if you ask me to do it now again, I probably won't get it right. But that's how I did it. That's how I did it. I, um, what I want to ask you is why, why is it so effective? These, you know, the, because the third person is you this. Are, yeah. yeah. Why, why yeah. is it so effective? So basically, Authors are drug dealers. Um, We cause people to look at little symbols on a page. And if they've got the kind of imagination that um, creates, some people unfortunately don't have that capacity, but I've got this thing. I will read a story. I will will no longer see the words. I will see it playing out like a movie in my head. It's, it's, this is probably why I love reading so much because I completely lose myself in the story and I see and I taste and I touch and I feel and it's just amazing. Um, and this is why, for instance, movie adaptions always invariably disappoint me because it never matches the glory that I see in my head. So what happens is in order to create these hallucinations, you need to seat your reader very firmly in the world and the point of view of the, the narrator. 
So even if you're doing a first person narrator of like, I walk down the street and I see the blah, 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 fish paste and all of that, you're going to make the readers feel the sunlight on the person's skin. You're going to make them feel the hunger in their stomach. Maybe they haven't had breakfast or maybe they, they really want that cup of coffee and now they're fantasizing about that first cup of coffee or, um, you know, and or they're feeling sad. So if they are feeling sad, they will notice things around them that make them feel even more sad. Like, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever had days where the weather's gloomy and all you see as you're trundling along, as you see the flaky paint on the walls and the litter and the dog shit on the ground and you just see all the bad things. So by having a character who's sad, just noticing the bad things and feeling the cold and feeling the discomfort, you are now using your environment to say more about your character and how they experience the environment. Whereas somebody who's in a happy mood, they might be noticing that the weed is pushing its way through the crack in the cement and they think how wonderful it is that life finds a way and they will see the birds flying, you know, that the other person didn't notice because they were too busy staring at the ground. So you can sort of use your way your character relates to environment to show their mood, um, how their thoughts are. Like if you see a bird flying, it might remind you of a bird that you saved from a swimming pool when you were a kid and that will trigger memories and those memories might be happy memories. So now you've also got an opportunity to, to sort of show things in the character's past that are triggered by things happening in the present. So it's all about seating yourself in the character at the time. And then of course getting to combat scenes for instance. Um, you know, once again there you've got the opportunity to work with environment um, combat doesn't necessarily happen in an easy environment. There are obstacles that you can stumble over. There might be an incline. Um, you might be thrown into a wall. Um, you might have to dodge traffic. You know, it's 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 not you know easy and neat and tidy. So by making and also just the, showing the frustration of the fact of um, I don't know if you've been in a situation where someone's trying to hit you or stab you. Yes, I have been when yeah. I was when anyway. I was in, in high school or primary school, and, and then when I was yeah. a student. You realize, yeah, so you realize how quickly and in, in a moment of of combat um, combat situation happens. Like for instance, I was stabbed a few years well, a good few years ago. Um, I was just minding my own business, walking down the road in Hart Bay, and um, some guy tried to steal my bag. And it was just all I remember was this guy grabbing my bag, and like it doesn't even twig that he was trying to take my bag. So I just held onto my bag and I said, like, "Hey, hey, hey, what are you doing?" And next thing I know, he's smacking me in the arm with a knife, and I couldn't figure out what was going. But I was just angry because now I realised he was trying to take my bag. And the only thing that went through my head was like. This guy and I was shouting at him and saying all sorts of very bad language. I won't repeat here because when I'm angry, I default to Afrikaans. And I grew up in Hart Bay, and I grew up learned a lot of the the coloured people's culture there, with the words that are often used <laughs> amongst their culture. And um, I'm not going to repeat them because I I can really swear like 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 a like a like a Hart Bay Hart Bay fisherman. Um, <laughs> And I was screeching at him with all these wonderful expletives that belong in in the fishing industry. And um, the guy hightailed off. The whole incident probably lasted less than 10 seconds. And I literally had time to hold onto my bag, shout at him, and car stopped and he, they ran off. But in that time, I'd gotten stabbed and... It was only afterwards that the wound starts hurting because now the adrenaline starts wearing off. So see, you sort of become very aware of things that happen. Like if you're in a stressful situation, you're going to be focused on the immediate stress situation there. So, I mean, like when I read combat situations where the bombshells flying and bullets whizzing past and characters have this time to have this long conversation. You've heard a gun sh gunshot, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Have you been in a firing range? Yes, um, I've used guns myself, yeah. Yeah. You know how loud that gets. Yes. So now you've got a war zone. Characters are not going to have time or opportunity to have a long conversation. You know, like, are you okay? Yes, go, go, go. You know, it's going to be that sort of intensity. Um, you're not really going to be worried about all the other things going along 
around you, you're going to be worried about the guy trying to blixen you with a knife here and the guy over there that's trying to smack you with a baseball bat. You know, that's your immediate concern. Um, and you're going to try and duck. So you're going to be conscious of quick movements. And um, some, I mean, oh gosh, the worst is if someone claps you on the head, you get clapped on the head, your world grays out for a second, you know, and you disorientated. I mean, like the other morning, I opened the fridge door on my forehead. So if anyone sees the lovely bruise there, it's not because my husband beats me. Um, <laughs> you know, you stand there, you've clapped yourself in the face with the door and it's like, oh, who am I? Where am I? How am I? Oh, Edward, well, ow, you know, that sort of delayed reaction. So getting into the physicality of it and understanding that if someone's going to be clapped on the head and they're, they're clapped hard enough that they pass out, they need to get to ER. They're not going to get up and fight again like they do in the movies. Um, it's sort of being aware, having situational awareness. Um, I mean, it's very cute in the films when, when one person at a time attacks the hero who's got the sword you know that's very cute it doesn't happen like that in real life if, if there's a mob attacking somebody they're all going to try and go from at the same time so i always tell people try and aim for realism um if you don't know much about combat um go and google there are so many amazing videos on youtube i mean i've learned stuff about how to fight with pole arms um, and why fighting with a spear is actually really good when you're facing a sword um, who's going to come off second best if you're looking at someone who's got a katana versus a, 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 a claymore, you know, like all sorts of little things like that. You can do so much research. Um, I, I once did a, a research to find out how does a woman break a grapple, uh, how does a woman break a grapple hold when a man is sitting on top of her? And there were so many videos already out there just showing how a small woman can literally just throw a big guy onto his side and, you know, get free. So do your research um like you've fired guns before i've done archery lessons i've done horseback riding um i've done animal rescue i've done all sorts of interesting things that feed into my writing and if you don't know how to do something ask 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 people so that you can get that ring of um sort of authenticity in the writing don't refer to hollywood hollywood oh god there's like like the stuff in hollywood is so implausible um so rather yeah, I mean, go to youtube and find people i mean I, I did a lot of research for with the driving scenes the fight scenes i kept short and i mean i did a lot of research but i kept it short i didn't want to go into long because i tried to back punch in in a very short view so i like the short kind of fight scenes sh shooting scenes where people don't like you said they don't know what's going on it's it happens so fast and it's out there but what i want to ask you is now you've done your research, right? Um, and you have to convey all this on paper. It's easy, it's easy, it's easier to do the research than to now convey it on page, to put that down on page. Do you get to a point where it becomes natural? Because for me, it wasn't natural. It was like hours and hours. And I did this over a long time. I didn't rush this novel. It was a hobby on the side. So, you know, it yeah. took me hours and hours and hours and when, if i wasn't happy about it i would do it over again but do you get to a point where it becomes more natural and like okay you do it quicker and you you don't have to refer to all the the links and stuff i i refer to the links constantly and the reading material um so that i i mean sometimes two weeks would go past and i have to go back and refresh my memory then i would go back to the drawing board do you get to a point where you just you don't need that stuff or do you always have to do that i think it becomes with enough practice i feel it becomes innate but um like for instance the project that i'm working on at the moment um me and my friend toby we when we went up in 2019 when before the panda actually was when was it it was, it was 2000 and frick what year was the pandemic again 2020 2020 yeah it was 2019 october 2019 we went up to um joburg for the award ceremony and we were sitting there in the in the in the very larny hotel room the the the, the lounge area it was half past 11 and neither of us felt like going to bed yet so we sat there and we go, oh you know it was so much fun let's write a novel together cool let's write a novel together and toby and i have got very very different ways of writing but we 
approached it from the perspective I said to him we're going to write a trilogy <laughs> um, let's do the outlining um, who the characters and we talked about it a lot and eventually we got started but now it's coming to the revisions process and I find with the first draft um, we just concentrate on putting down the story so for instance Toby's strengths lie with dialogue my strengths lie with world building so what happens is now Toby does his whole lot of lines so he's got a lot of talking a lot of introspection um, whereas I would then go Toby you need to we need to show them where the characters are what the time of day is so then I would then go back and I would paint in that kind of detail or I would think well he's having all these thoughts but he's not actually having sort of physical a physical thing that's locking him into the thing and that's another thing that I often see with younger writers or newer writers is um, not so much with you because I think you already had your characters very ingrained in their environment, you know, having a job, the consequences of the actions, you know, you could see all of that with the character. He lives in his environment. And a lot of people, and I think this is the problem that I've had with some um, books that I'm sort of reading, especially with those, you can tell that they haven't really read widely, is that their characters seem untethered. It's like they do things but none of their actions actually have consequences like for instance um one one book i'm reading at the moment um the character is an ex-slave from the roman era and he will just talk about he didn't do his chores and now he's busy lying in, in the grass looking at the sunlight and i'm like thinking that is not plausible um or he's late home one night and he sneaks out because he wants to go and visit a friend it's like that and he does so without any repercussions. Um, and it, it's like you see it with the YA novels these days as well, where a lot of the, you know, it's adults writing about teenagers, but they've forgotten the fact that teenagers are still very much um, beholden to their parents. You know, Baba's yes. You know, it's like your parents want to know why you were out late, you know, or like you didn't do your homework. You're going to get into trouble with the teachers and the teachers are going to call your parents. There's, there's none of the feeling that they're living in the environment or that the parents are just these cardboard cutout figures that sort of exist in the background and um you know people who in and if you talk about adult novels like people who miss days of work but they don't get a disciplinary hearing you know or they have all this stuff happen but they don't seem to have a discernible source of income and and it all gets back to making the characters feel that they have a lived in world that they've got you know limitations to their behaviors i mean your character's got a lot of limitations because he's got um the the condition that is slowly yes. robbing him of his ability to walk which is a ticking time bomb because you've already sort of shown that he had this experimental treatment that helped him walk and he was having this wonderful life and we meet him where he's had this wonderful life but what has he actually done with it that's that exactly what i that was, that was what i what i was aiming for definitely to this 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 the, the, try to to, to, to create a character that's that's very different from me, that's more flawed, um, and yet uh, he wants to be he wants to be better. He wants to do good. He wants to make up with his um, with the other with with his uh, um, with his previous girlfriend, and he wants to um, not to be this hardened businessman, you know. So yeah, I I I understand exactly what you're saying exposition so exposition is something that i got extremely wrong um i remember i had this one so i had the storyline and then before i applied michael haig's structure i had this one serious information dump um and it was it was terrible 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 so everything came together at this one stage, um, but then so I got I had to go back to to exposition and wh why it's there. Why why is it so important? Is it because you want to keep the reader's attention? You want to throw through Easter eggs um, because people will just get bored if they read this thing and then, and then they'll be disappointed later on if you just give them everything all at once. That's probably it, isn't it? Or is there more to it? If you're going to be giving large blocks of information, you've really got to ask yourself, is there a better way in which you can do it? Um, 
for instance, the one example that I often use is like many, many years ago, I was editing a gentleman who was writing a book he assured me was not science fiction, but it was about a Mars colony. And um, it was all speculative sort of science. And you can see he's somebody who reads a lot of um, nonfiction. So he was obviously thinking about, I think in his mind, he was like thinking, how would a Mars colony work? And then he set out to write a book that was basically just his pet theories about how colonizing Mars would work. He never read any books that were already based as a Martian colony. There's a very famous um, set of books called, oh gosh, I can't remember who the author is. I think the one book is Red Mars, Blue Mars. I cannot recall the author. I haven't read the books, but I know for a fact that they are sort of, it's like, I think it's a trilogy and it's just basically about the terraforming of Mars. And I'm sure that there's a wonderful compelling story, um, but it's just that there are books out there that do deal with the topic. And this gentleman was adamant. He's not writing science fiction and he's not going to look at those other books. And I said, well, it's a good idea to be aware of what the other books in the genre are that you are writing. Um, just so that you don't inadvertently reinvent the wheel or use plot plot points that are similar. But then getting to the what made the novel painful for me to work with was he would then talk about, I think he had a, a, some sort of fancy dark matter drive. And it's all speculative science. You know, you can read about it in the science magazines about how they speculate what dark matter is. And then he was then spending five or six pages describing how the hyperdrive works. And I said, I said to most people, I just thought and I said, nobody cares how the hyperdrive works. They do not want to read five pages about how the hyperdrive works. All they are interested in is the banter between Chewbacca and Han Solo as they get the Millennial Falcon to go through hyperspace. And the hijinks that ensue if something breaks with the hyperdrive, there's Chewie getting into the basement with a wrench and going bang, bang, bang and fixing things. You know, um, so, you know, you can rather show how the thing works. If they've run out of fuel, I mean, you've watched Futurama, they don't spend hours explaining to you why Nibbler's poop is the best fossil fuel known for, for space travel, but they just show, you know, Bender goes to fetch the poop out of the poop tray and you realize, Bunk, it's very heavy. And it's this tiny little round black ball, but, you know, it takes Bender like an age to carry the poop and put it into the furnace, you know. So, you know, they're not explaining to you why the, this creature that eats just about everything that's edible makes us poop. It's just shown that this creature makes poop like that. We don't know why, and it's not important we know why, but it's a good creature to have on board because you can use its poop to fly your place, your station, uh, your fly your your spaceship. So, and, that, and that's sort of like readers don't want history lessons. This is why people find the Silmarillion boring, unless they're a Tolkien nerd who wants to read an obscure passage about why Tom Bombadil married this one. You know, and, um, you know, the people who want to go and read all that stuff, they will go and read it. But um, when you are writing for market and you want people to buy your, buy your books, people read your books because, A, they want to be entertained, and B, they want to step into a world that's unlike their own. I mean, why do we read crime novels? We read crime novels because we want to hear about people who solve terrible crimes. Because in real life, if you look at South Africa... There's so many unsolved crimes and terrible situations. So reading about somebody bringing someone to justice is incredibly satisfying. But when we are reading that book, we don't want the detective to talk about the judiciary system. Or go through, the, you know, discussing the process of booking somebody into, into the police station. You'll know, it's like, well, we took him in to be processed and then we were sitting in the interrogation room. We're not going to, like, talk about how the processing works. Um, I think one novel that does sort of fart around with exposition in a way, not that I've read it, um, because it's just not my genre, but um, we've got, um, I've read passages of American Psycho, where he sort of pontificates about Whitney Houston and all sorts of 80s pop music and why it's so great. And um, they're these little interludes that talk about the different paper site, paper grades for business cards and why it's better it's actually put in to tell you more about the character and it's not that you're getting 10 pages of Whitney Houston but you'll probably get a page and a half and then the story carries on again so you can gloss over it if you want to but now you've got an idea you've got the serial killer 
who is obsessed with like the tonal qualities of Whitney Houston's voice and why this fabric is better than that fabric. So you're getting a picture built about him. But there, once again, the, the writer is good enough that he can break the rules. Um, it's not going to be like you're going to break in the middle of the story to give 10 pages about why, how coffee is farmed on an obscure estate in Guatemala. Less is more. That's the other thing that I say to people often, um, especially in terms of exposition. And as you say, you've you've got information that you need to impart. Now, the tricky thing is you don't want to fall into the trap of, as you know, Bob type dialogue, because you don't want to have two characters who have the exact same information discussing that information as if neither of them actually know what they're talking about. So where that kind of dialogue will work is if you've got one character who's very knowledgeable and he's trying to convince somebody else of the experimental treatment, but he'll probably then either, and this is now where characterization is so important, like if it's a very highfalutin scientist who doesn't really care that people don't understand him, he'll brandish all these terms. And it's like when I went recently for my dermatologist and she started going, oh, this is a lovely blah, blah, rhubarb fresh paste. And I'm like, what? And this is a la, la, la. And she's like busy working on my face. And she's like telling me all these like Latin terms. And I was like, what are you talking about? So that will say more about the character who's now doesn't really care that people don't understand them or you might have an opportunity now with a very empathetic um scientist trying to explain to the layman about the process that they're just going to go undergo and he says um we're going to lift the skin flap and we're going to do the blah 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 and they will talk in plain english so they once again you've got an opportunity not only impart vital information to the character to the readers about this process that's happening but you can also show that the scientist is stopping themselves from running off with all the scientific terms. And um, you're able to convey information in a way that doesn't feel like two scientists discussing the hyperdrive. They both know intimately. And it's like, as you know, Bob, the interstellar hyperdrive switches on with this button. Yes, I know. I know, John. And it has this blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it's, it's contrived. And it's also boring. So you... You want to have your dialogue flowing as naturally as possible and for that i always say like listen to how go and listen to a lecture um there's so many lectures on youtube and go and see how a, 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 especially if there's a lecture where there's question and answer happening uh, and see how people um change their tones or their word choices if they sense that somebody is not grasping a situation very very well so and i said so a lot of the time you can put your exposition into dialogue um a lot of time, if you if there is information that you need to convey, like for instance, you want to convey the fact that your character is missing their departed father, you can show them at the opening scene where they're walking down the street and they're passing the ice cream parlor where their dad always used to buy them ice cream. So you can bring in the backstory of his he's missing his father, he's been dead for six years because he sees the ice cream place where they used to get ice cream when he was a little kid. So now you're showing a very key point in his life but you're also conveying that he's lost his father and that he misses his father. So you don't just start the passage with like this thing. Bob was sad. Today was the anniversary of his father's death. His father had been a good man and his father had been a postman who used to go through the whole village and blah. You know, you, you miss all of that. But like, for instance, if you want to convey the fact that his father was a postman, you can show them the memory where they were sitting on the bench and you can remember how his, his father used to take his postman cap off and would put it on his lap. So there you're already conveying that his father was a postman without saying his father was a postman. Um, you know, so there's all these wonderful opportunities when you play with environment and and how environment triggers memories and how the memories and then also the information that you feed in must be appropriate to the scene as well. Like for instance, if the story is mostly about a boy with his daddy issues, so you will then at various points of the story have these 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 events that trigger the memories that help build the, the backstory in such a way that it feels organic that it's not just this like you know this prologue that's eight pages long which is giving his whole backstory because you want readers to be prepared when you start at chapter one yes. this is why i said people prologues prologues generally you can probably take your prologue and i mean although i'll say to people prologues can die what i said to people these days when i coach them i said listen i've read your prologue now it's a great prologue I want you to just keep in mind that you might be giving too much information away right at the beginning and you might just want to set the prologue aside and we finish the edits and then we decide afterwards whether you feel the prologue is still needed 
because you can't tell them, oh, cut your product, cut it, cut it, cut it. Um, that it, it's got to be from the authors. You've got to sort of kind of lead them to the water and make them see that perhaps the prologue might not be the best thing to wedge in there if you want to give the whole history of Middle Earth before the novel starts. <laughs> okay, no, <laughs> Just, I've yeah. got you. I understand. Yeah. Okay, so the, 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 I wanted to ask you a little bit more about characterization. You've made, we've mentioned it before, and you also mentioned it now. Uh, I struggled with that. Because obviously, because I, I'm writing about a character that's very close to home, he's got the same disease. I, I also used this. I used my life as a template. Um, but I, I, I understand. I started to realize I mean, with your with your first assessment. Also, you didn't tell me anything about it, but I could see in the way in which you asked questions about um, this character's life that it's 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 just not work because in the first versions i think he was more like me and i wanted to get him away from me oh, that's a difficult thing to do i think the thing is and i mean going to i'm going to skirt around the concept of marty stew and mary sue um which i think is a terms that are often misused quite terribly but um and and i get this a lot i mean like for instance whenever we've got the next big thing um and i mean i've seen a lot of i've been in the publishing industry long enough and i've read enough slush piles to sort of see the patterns as they start emerging when twilight became so popular suddenly a lot of people who'd never read books before as pop as well had never devoured books as much as they as until twilight suddenly discovered twilight and now they wanted to also write stories that excited them as much as that so what they would do is they would make their version of bella but they would have themselves as the bella character having this romance with this wonderful boy who's a sparkly vampire and because they want to recapture that excitement that they had when they read um twilight and then i saw exactly the same happening with 50 shades of gray um i've seen exactly the same happening with um academy style magical novels um although people seem to labor under the misconception that harry potter was the first it's not the first um there was other books that had similar concepts for instance the timothy hunter character created in neil gaiman's books of magic um which is loosely coupled to the sandman universe and then there's also um, a book i can't remember the author but it was books that i read when i was a kid um i think it was called winnie the worst witch in the world and there's a couple of stories all about her also in an academy setting, you know, all the kitten, all the kittens get handed out, but she gets the kitten that's got the tabby stripes. That she doesn't get a black kitten. When she does potions, her potions all go wrong. When she gets the broom, her broom doesn't fly properly. You know, she's that. She, that's that's her sort of story. So here comes Harry Potter, who's this um, amount. He's this combination of 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 um, Winnie and 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 Timothy Hunter. And anybody who says that's not the case obviously hasn't read the source material. But, I mean, you've been around the block enough times, you get to see it. So a lot of the newer writers, they've got these stories. And I often say to people, when you start writing and you're not sure what you want to write, go and write fan fiction. Get those first few stories out of your system where you feel that you are the character in the story. <laughs> you know, um, I, I loved, I absolutely adored Highlander when I was not 11, when I first saw it. And I didn't. Oh, uh, that's one of my favorite I, movies also. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And my first, first attempt at writing a novel was basically very badly framed Highlander fan fiction. Um, I'm not going to talk about it because it was really bad, but um, <laughs> it was my very first it was very i wanted to write i wanted to create i wanted to recreate that and I, I sort of put myself in the position of my main character who's this young farm boy who gets jerked into this alternate reality where he's now fighting the black knight and um it was really bad um but i wanted to have those experiences so you, you transport yourself but you don't often think of yourself critically that's the problem so you get these characters who are very um bland they they sort of everybody nobody really hates them or nobody really likes them or maybe just everybody likes them and they don't seem to they don't seem to have any um um obstacles in their paths so it's and then you know they, they want to give them superpowers so they end up making these characters that have all these amazing abilities and there's no cost involved and it's just it's flat so and and i mean it, it's it's just when you start thinking about character, like, I mean, if I think about some of my characters, 
um, my very first novel was called Kefra Rising, and it featured, and it, that novel came together because in my more goth days, I was often, you know, in the black hair and the black eyes and the black clothes, walking down Fishwick Main Road in, in Fishwick, and some little old lady with lilac glasses jumped in front of me and says, Jesus loves you. <laughs> I was so taken aback because I was busy fantasizing. I don't know what I was thinking about. <laughs> going home after a long time. I'm thinking about, I don't know, cockroaches, who knows. And suddenly this very Christian lady jumps up, grabs me by my arm and to tell me that Jesus loves me. <laughs> and like, and then when I thought about it, how did she see me? She must have thought that I am this evil Satanist who is in desperate need of help. And she needs to tell me that I need help. Meanwhile, I'd been thinking about kittens and, I don't know, cuddly thoughts and what I was going to cook for dinner that night and the fact that I own a house and, and, I own a, and you know, I'm married and I have pets and, you know, <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with me. So that story seed then triggered for me to write the characters. I said, then I asked myself the question, what if I was that character that she thought I was? Wow. Okay. And that's how, that's how and, and that's where a character came out my jamie my jamie character i love him dearly he's a complete wanker but um but he basically i took all the qualities that other people would see in some sort of evil character and he's actually a really nice guy but he's into like like he runs an occult bookshop and he does dark magic and he um, but he loves animals but everyone thinks that he's this evil, terrible person, but he's just the black magician who lives in Fishhook and sells books. It's like like <laughs> like that, like the Eddie character in Stranger Things. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot like that. So, you know, he's 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 go he goes out of his way to dress provocatively. And he's very flamboyant. And and he's very obsessed with his appearance. Um, which is not I mean, you can see I'm dressed in a hoodie and so, so this is how, this is just the story journey that I'm talking about, how to take a character that starts with you and then to turn it into something that is not you. You look at all the things that are like, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not a, a gay man either or, 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 bi, or a bi man. So that's another point of thing of taking the character and gender swapping it so that it's not female and then taking what I perceived as being an amalgamation of all the all the all the goth guys that I've known over the years and, and just sending it up and um, over exaggerating until you've got this character who's completely over the top and it's no longer resembling me. Then the other one as well, um for instance Ash in my books um um that my books my do my those who return duology um he starts out as a a ninety year old granny who is part of an ancient Egyptian reincarnation cult she dies the first time and then she comes back but she comes back in the wrong body she's supposed to come back in the body of a young girl except she accidentally wakes up in the body of a six foot tall metal head <laughs> so that's brilliant <laughs> so now although i know the main character that i sort of based on looks and aesthetics of peter Steele from typo negative but i put a 90 year old granny in his head that's <laughs> that's so, interesting. Um, although it, it's got it's got it's got essences of me because I, I in many ways I'm that ninety year old granny who likes drinking her tea and no oh, get off my lawn. Um, <laughs> oh, so, and now suddenly you're dealing with that. So many of your characters. You take a character and you yes, don't... You, a lot of your characters, even though they're very separate from you, will have some of you. In them. I mean, yeah. for instance, in my case, I think all of the characters in in, my, in the alienation gene have a little bit of me in them. And, and it's funny, like some of my friends would have asked me in the first the first few months when I said I was going to write a book, they would ask, "Am I going to be in it?" <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, I think most of the characters are, are, are versions of me, or or like a, you know, I the way in which I perceive other people. So it's much more me than anyone else yeah, around. Yeah. So I, yeah, I understand no, sure. exactly. 
So, I mean, that's the fun. I mean, you the, the thing is, obviously, you need to be able to relate to the character. Um, and I think, for instance, with my book, Incarna, where the book started is I had this very vivid dream about how I was in the wrong body and how I was suddenly six foot three and I had this long black hair and this big physique and people were scared of me and they were getting out of my way because I was walking there with a big black leather jacket and ripped jeans and I suddenly thought, wow, that's what it feels like to be inhabiting a six foot something male frame and how people see you differently. So that sort of brings in that, so, so, so even if, if I, in my head, I'm still this, but in my physical self, I'm that, how do I leverage the tension? Um, I think one character that might be the closest to who I am in real life would probably be um, my book, The Company of Birds. I've got a character there called Lisa. And Lisa is a failed academic in, who has zero magic in a magical academy environment. And she lectures in ancient languages that nobody's really interested in. And she's basically, I think she was sort of born out of my frustration of newspaper publishing, of being passed over and the betrayal of people close to you who shnai you and you know she's dealing through a bitter divorce her her ex-husband's left her for a much younger girl who's gotten pregnant and you know she's got all this shit that's going on in her life and it's just it was so nice to try and take some of my frustrations from real life and stuff that's happened to me in my past and to sort of work them together so it does become quite cathartic at times um, I don't know if you felt that your story was cathartic at times to, to sort of deal with to deal with some of the issues. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a little bit of cheap cheap therapy, rather. I think from my perspective, it was a little bit of... So there were times that I lived, you know, because, I mean, there's, there's many of the scenes are very close to home, but that's just because mm. we, are, we both have the same disease. Um, and many of the, the... I mean, you you can't... Um, you can't divorce that. So you can't, mm. you're going to have the same emotional experiences. So I mean, it was good for me to go through those things in a different body, almost like, even though we had the same. And remember, in this case, as you said, it, it, he had this life that I didn't have. Um, he, he became cured, right? So he was cured from this uncurable disease. And I had no, who knows what that's like? I mean, who knows? I'm not sure if I got it right. I mean, maybe if I write the book again in three years' time with, with more knowledge about other um, cures that's coming out now, I will have a different view. But at the time when I wrote the book, that's what I thought someone would act like that has been cured. So, But that was also a bit of therapy for me because right, I can tell you anyone with a rare disease their biggest, no matter how hard or an old dog they are, you know, maybe many years of having disease, of having this kind of disease, all of us want that magical cure. Um, we, mm -hmm. We're looking for that magical cure. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a way for me to just live myself into that position a little while. And I was, at some point, I was crying, like really, really in the beginning. When I was very close to this book, I was really, really crying and it was very emotional. But then later on, I, w I got so, as I said, when I moved further away from this character, I got so removed that I started enjoying it. More. So it was, almost, it was like dealing with all those, um, you know, and all, the, all those hidden, um, I would say, I wouldn't say aggression, but like passive, aggress passive aggressiveness, but just like mm -hmm. anger, the, the residual anger that was left. Uh, that I had, I, I could deal with mm. when I'm writing this book. And I could leave this character behind, like, you know, whatever I felt, I, I put into this character. So that that was, that definitely from my perspective, that's how I saw and it. And you know, the funny thing is, and this is the other thing that I'm going to add, just also, if you've now got several novels under your belt, which I hope you do write more. Um, I will, I will, don't future. worry. I, this is, there was just, this was just practice. This was just practice. So you'll find it does get easier to sort of divorce yourself from the character. You will always start with a kernel. A, I always believe in starting with a kernel that's familiar. Um, and then the character, as you travel with them, they change, they develop, they, they fail. 
Um, and then I'm going to bring a term in that I've been using with my friend Jay, whom we're working on role-playing games together. And um, he talks a lot about failing forward. So it's not so, so necessary that your character fails and their life is over, but they fail forward. You know, they, they, their failure presents them with opportunities in which to grow. And, and that, I think, is what makes writing so transformative because it's not just also the own, your own journey as a writer to write, but um, you're creating a little bit of magic and you're telling stories about people who are in these terrible situations and you give readers hope. And I think that's probably the most important thing that an author can do is, I mean, and why would the, why does the story of the farm boy who becomes the Jedi Knight so, so universal? It's because we all feel very ordinary and dull and we all want to feel that we have agency and that we can take down the Dark Lord. <laughs> that's the crux of the matter. And yeah. um, whatever shape or form the Dark Lord takes, whether it's <laughs> Darth Vader, or if it's a crippling disease that leaves a character in a wheelchair, yeah. um, it's, it how you deal with, it's how you deal with the uh, obstacles and the challenges that come your way. And that's where the story comes from. That's it. No one wants to read about the hero who stays in his room and doesn't ever leave. If, if there's the no motivation has... and there's no desire and there's no conflict, Who's, why do you, why would there be a story? Yeah, that's I mean, it. Everybody, I mean, if you look at people's daily lives, I mean, we've all got routine. We've all got, you know, a, a set routine that we follow. And the sad thing is, we we are sleepers. We are sleeping through life. So you know, to be able to create meaning and to create a story that 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 has that sort of break from reality, it's so important because it it just shakes us out of our complacency. And that's what a good book does. And and there was another thing the other day that I saw now, which kind of ground my gears or grinded my gears, was people saying, uh, I think I'm going to give this book a bad star review because there was a character who had bad thoughts. And, <laughs> and I'm like, so you just want to read a story where everyone's happy, where everyone's having good thoughts, where nothing goes wrong, where nobody goes out and saves the cat there's no story there and it doesn't teach us anything. So how are you going to cope with real life? If with all the disappointments, if you haven't had the inspiration of dealing with Senna, for instance, a character that's dealing with a debilitating disease, how mm. does he cope with it? The character could have just, I, I call it van Krippier van Yes. He ends course. up on the wildest minibus taxi ride I've ever read in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. I have driven on that road. I know what that road's like. I've had bad experiences on that road with these massive trucks and whatnot. So when I was reading that, I was like going, holy frick. And there's a young boy who driver's license at the wheel. And it's just chaos. And they're being chased what? by an ambulance. It was just completely bonkers. I mean, the, but the character's in a wheelchair, but he's having yeah. these crazy adventures. I guess he was born out of fear, you know. Uh, if you just think about the, the craziest, uh, most scary situation that I can find myself because I, having a, dis a debilitating disease, you always need someone to assist you. So now, I mean, that for me is extremely scary. And also, I, I, I yeah. couldn't find anyone else to drive the taxi <laughs> because who's going to drive the taxi? I found myself in a plot twist there, but it worked. But I want to ask you one last question. Why do we need editors? Why do new authors need this guidance? Why do we need editors in the first place? Cool. Why do we need editors? Okay, I will let you in on a secret. Even I still need an editor. Um, the reason being is when you're writing, you're very close to the story. Um, you simply don't see the issues and your eyes get tired. I mean, I do have a very good course that I've written about self-editing that I have um, actually just sort of written as an essay that I do send to people if they want to read it. Um, so self-editing is great. Then there's a lot of stuff that you can train yourself to do to get your novel as perfect as possible. But when you've read your novel and you can attest to that fact and the reason why I sent you on to Cat was because I knew that they they had fresh eyeballs. By the time I've read the manuscript four or five times, I'm not going to see the dropped words. You need at least two or three other sets of eyeballs on a manuscript at various stages. And um, when I was still, I mean, if I'm working with 
in one small press that I used to work with, we had people whose jobs was just line editing. We had some people's jobs was just structural editing. Um, and the structural editor would do two rounds of edits and then that manuscript would then go to the line editor who would then do line by line editing. And then there'd be a last person who would still do proofreading. So there would be at least that those many stages. And and this is what I say to, especially to people who are going to be indie, um, indie authors, you are now going to take the amount of money that the publisher would have spent on your book and you're funding it yourself. So you are going to get a cover designer, the editor who's going to do your major structural stuff. Then you're going to take to somebody else who's going to just look for the other little gremlins. And then what you still had, you had your friend who did the proofreading, which thank God you did that. So we had all of those different stages and we caught so many errors, dropped words, names that change in spelling, eye color that changes um stuff like that that if you've looked at it so many times you miss it i miss it you know it needs to and i mean i will still pick up one of my books that was traditionally published and i'll go to a page on and i will see a typo so even with your traditionally published books i mean i remember the edition of um one robin hobb book that came out the most recent one that she released um, there was a find and replace error in the ebook that made me laugh because I knew exactly how it had happened. Um, they were talking about the Gary seagulls that were flying across the sky. And I went, Gary seagulls? Uh, and then, then, then they were talking about a man and the man was Gary. But, 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 but this is not Gary. And this is a fantasy book. There's nobody with the name Gary. And then it twigged. Somebody had translated the book from UK English to us english or vice versa and they had just done a find and replace and they hadn't actually looked at where ouch ouch, where ouch no. and and i've had i've heard some horror stories about that going wrong so this is why you need a proofreader oh yes um, some of the work that I, yeah some of the work that i do as well um i do qa work for big publisher in the uk and it's not not glamorous at all i get the epub file I open it up in Kindle, in the um, Kindle, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the desktop version of Kindle. Um, and I check that all the, the panes in the contents pane, all the contents titles are spelled correctly. I then check that every single link goes between the link on the chapter to the contents. So then I have to check the chap click, 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 click. If it's a nonfiction book, I have to check every single footnote by clicking on it. I have to check every single external link to see that it goes out to the correct website, that the website loads, that they don't get 404 errors, and that I'm that idiot who then has to tabulate all Then I have to do, um, I read the first paragraph of each chapter um, to see that that sometimes when people copy paste, they don't um, say sometimes miss the, the quotation marks. I check for any unusual glitches that happen because sometimes it doesn't always translate smoothly. So you've got situations where spaces disappear after commas or there are bad breaks in words or, you know, you, you, you have to check for all these things. So that is like stuff that I didn't even know back in the day that needs to be checked for. But I mean, that's just, and that's not even checking that things are spelled correctly. That is literally just checking that whoever pressed the button to create the EPUB file, it didn't add weird gremlins in the process because some weird shit happens then. Um, so, and then just also your proofreader is there to catch, catch those other little gremlins that happen in, because now if the Gary seagulls had been caught, they would never have gone through because somebody didn't pick it up. So, you know, and, and you can check exhaustively as much as you want, and there will always be something wrong. Your, the, 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 the thing is we aim to reduce the incidences of gremlins to 0.1% if we can. And and, that, and that's the bone. And also just an editor, for instance, will be able to tell you, I mean, like, I, I read a lot of indie books and I do a lot of book reviews for indie authors because I feel that they get a very raw end of the deal. But some of the common things like an editor would catch, like this person was writing a secondary world fantasy novel, but they use terms like, oh, he was flying under the radar. Now, if you're dealing with a Renaissance era story, no one's going to talk about flying under the radar. Yeah, definitely not. It. I haven't, yeah. So, so but I also, I mean, I also, uh, yeah. there's also this thing that, I mean, you look at the first draft, you, you, you give it back to me, I have to fix it. While I'm fixing it, 
I'm making other mistakes, unfortunately. Then I give it. That's just that's how. Then I give it to uh, the second um, editor. Um, they they edit it. Um, I'm making more mistakes, and so that, that's why that's why it mm. was very crucial to have a proofreader. But even after the proofreader, um, there are mistakes that I picked up that the proofreader won't pick up, because these are not spelling and grammar and those things. It's things that. Not none of the editors will pick it up. It's things that I pick up because it's maybe an abbreviation of the protagonist's name that's out of place. So, you know, he may have changed his name. I'm not going to go into detail, but then it's it's there where it shouldn't be. I will pick it up, or I'll make a, a small mistake in referring to uh, to a relationship that's this, but it should be that. Yeah. I mean, it's small mistakes. But it's 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 very small. But you but but you but you get to that point. Yeah, all those mistakes. The buck stops with the with the indie author, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, the buck stops with the indie author. Um, and as I said, you know, when I mean, for instance, my, with the process that I'm following at the moment, because I don't have huge piles of dough, I do a lot of um, trade exchanges with other authors. So, like for instance, with Cat. Um, I will say to them, okay, I will I will proofread your novel if you proofread my novel. So then we sort of have a trade exchange there, and that really works very well because then between me and Toby, we do. I'm very good with the grammar stuff, but he's very good at the developmental stuff. So, but what he will also do is he will read out the entire novel out loud, and do all the changes that way. So we've created a a, a, a sort of a chain of responsibility, and especially also with the role playing guides that I'm busy that I edit role playing guides. I'm working with a company called um, Storm Bunny Studios, and I'm busy now with a 400-page player's guide. <laughs> it's huge. And um, and I'm very glad that my friend gave me the work because I'm seeing like a lot of his little quirks that he wouldn't know to catch. The fact that he's got misplaced modifiers or that when he's typing very fast, he will... When he's trying to type the letter N, his finger sometimes strikes the, the R key at the same time. And, um, you know, it's not something that you'll necessarily pick up because you're typing fast and you're reading fast and you've got a lot on, so you don't notice it. So this is why the editor matters, because then the editor can go, dude, you do this thing. And then, um, then they can then go, okay, I do this thing. If your editor, a good editor is worth their weight in gold especially when you've worked with them on multiple novels, um, they you get into a flow state of you kind of know the person really well. Like I've edited most of Carrie Silverwood's novels. Um, so I kind of know, I can say to her, Carrie, you did X, Y, Z in this novel and now it's happening in this novel. And she says, oh yeah, that's true. So, you know, that's what's, when you build up a relationship with an editor, like for instance, when, I, when Storm Constantine passed away recently, Oh my God, it really just gutted me because she was this editor who'd come into my life and who really enabled me to dig deeper and dig deeper into my stories and to push myself harder and to lose her. It felt like my husband saying, yeah, but she didn't even know her. And I said, I know I didn't know her. But when you're working with an editor closely over multiple novels or multiple stories, they are part mentor, part psychologist, part counselor, part coach, and they kind of they they kind of important because they've seen your novel without their clothes on, well, the novel without its clothes on. That's true. That's so, true. You know, and they've they've they, they they they've seen your writing at its worst. Yes. So yes. And they, still, they still talk. To you, they still talk to you afterwards, and 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 it's that <laughs> partnership with people that are my long-term editors like for instance Kat and I we've been editing each other's work now ever since sure about almost 15 20 years now I think that's a long time yeah, yeah. sure um, well the time, time flies I mean time goes by so fast I mean for me this project was really just something on the side but if you think about it I approached you in 2018 I think wow so it's it's been I mean and that's I mean you're right it's like I've never met you um, and that's the wonder of the internet I guess but it's been and it's more so I I've, at times I have called you sensei 
<laughs> because I am I'm like you know a mental karate <laughs> um, scholar. Thank you so much. Thank you for for taking the time um, for helping me, and thank you for for all the help over the years. Uh, it really was rewarding, and I enjoyed it very much. Oh. Thank you. You are one of my little sponges. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your time. The awesome sauce. Cool, cool. Have a good one. Cool, cool. Yes. Bye. Bye.